Okay, so welcome to part two of the tutorial. Uh, in this part, we're going to have a look at the latest developments that have been happening over the last few years, where people have been using methods from machine learning uh, to train spiking neural networks. And I think this is like a really exciting time for this sort of work. It's really moving rapidly. There's loads of stuff going on. Um, so I'm really excited to be able to bring this to, uh, to a wider audience. Um, Right, so the question is, how do spiking neural networks learn? And uh, the short answer is uh, we still don't know. What we can do is break it down into two slightly separate questions. We can say, how do biological neurons learn? And we can also say, how can we train spiking neural network models to do interesting, difficult tasks? Uh, we'd expect these two questions to shed light on each other. And in fact, there's indeed, there's a big uh, literature on both of these approaches. You have the, the literature that primarily comes from experimental data on biological neurons. And you also have this more, more recent literature on training spiking neural networks um, uh, using methods from machine learnings. And I think you're also starting to see an emergence of, uh, of a literature that spans the, the space between these two. Uh, I think they're both worth pursuing independently. In this particular tutorial, because of the recent developments for spiking in particular, I'm going to focus on uh, on question two. How do we train spiking neural network models to do tasks? Before we get to that, let's just have a very brief uh, overview of uh, the, the sort of biological learning approach. Um, in general, we tend to think that learning happens by strengthening and weakening synapses. Now you saw in the models earlier that there was this parameter w so that when an incoming spike um, happens the membrane potential is increased by some factor w and the larger that is the more likely an input spike causes an output spike and so essentially the the larger w is we say the stronger the synapse is uh, and the more effect it has uh, and, and the idea is that learning basically strengthens or weakens those synapses and that's that's observed uh, experimentally in addition to that, we can also add and remove synapses. That's that's uh, observed a, a lot experimentally. We can also add and remove neurons. Um, that's less common, although it happens in some systems. Uh, and then there's other wild stuff that happens in biology that I think people have not really come to terms with in terms of uh, modeling. So for example, there's some recent work saying, showing that neurons can send each other little packets of RNA that affect learning. Uh, and I don't think we know quite how to think about that in terms of modeling yet, but uh, but it's very cool. So uh, some models uh, that are relevant for biological learning, but one of the primary ones for spiking neurons is uh, STDP, which is spike timing dependent plasticity. And the idea here is that if you have a presynaptic neuron that fires just before a postsynaptic neuron, then you will strengthen the connection. So here is the time difference between uh, the presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron. Uh, and when the presynaptic happens before, you get that the increase of the uh, synaptic weight uh, is positive. And when it's the other way around, when the postsynaptic neuron fires before the presynaptic neuron, uh, it makes the uh, synapse weaker. So that's uh, that's observed experimentally. It's fairly easy to incorporate that in uh, in models. And it showed a lot of early promise in the sense that you could find that the uh, network models based on that could do a lot of stuff. Um, as it's probably not still fully explored, um, but it seems much more difficult to build a really large uh, complex functional system than perhaps we first thought. You can improve that a bit perhaps by using a sort of reward modulated systems so that the learning is somehow gated by some reward. Um, but still, none of these are working that well for uh, for really hard tasks. Um, and of course, that raises a question, are they good models of the brain um, if they don't work for hard tasks? My point of view on that is that what makes the brain interesting is that it can solve hard tasks. So if you only study at solving easy tasks, you're somehow not studying the unique property um, of the brain. So let's get on to solving hard tasks in that case. Um, this didn't emerge two years ago. There's there's lots of uh, ideas that have been around for, for a long time. Um, I'll just mention a few. This is not by any means a comprehensive survey of everything. Uh, it's just some of the ones that uh, that I wanted to mention. Um, one of the earlier ones that was quite interesting and I think still has in some way a lot of promise as a model of the brain is reservoir computing. 
uh, also known as echo state networks, although that's more for rate based um, and liquid state machines. So the idea here is that you have some input layer um, and that's fed into a reservoir layer, which is a sort of randomly recurrently uh, connected set of neurons. Uh, and then that's fed via linear output into an output layer. And all you do when you train it is if, this can all be random and you train just this connection from the reservoir layer into the output layer. And it turns out that that's actually good enough to solve a lot of tasks. And basically what is happening is that um, because of the because the, of the structure of the reservoir, because of the random structure, it is doing all sorts of interesting computations. So there's like a sort of dictionary, as it were, of computations and of dynamics in this layer. And then the linear output can just pick out the relevant parts for what you're training for. Um, However, it doesn't, I don't know if it, this scales perfectly. In practice, the performance does seem to be uh, somewhat limited. Another interesting approach that is still very active um, is uh, evolutionary optimization. The challenge here is that this is very computationally expensive. So typically, you can only look at quite small networks with that. Now, the one that I'm going to be talking about in this tutorial is surrogate gradient descent. Uh, and this comes from uh, Friedman Zenka and a few others. Uh, and I'm going to come back to this later, so I won't say anything more about this right now. Uh, now, as I said, we uh, I don't want to assume any too much about what people's backgrounds are, so I'm just going to do a very brief introduction to artificial neural networks. Uh, but this is going to be really brief. If you want to see um, a better video about this, there's, there's lots of good sources um, uh, of videos online, and I'll, in I'll include some links to those uh, in the materials for this course. Okay, so here's my like uh, two minute version of it. So we start with some input X, we multiply it by some weight matrix W, we pass that through some uh, nonlinear activation function F, and that gives us an output F of WX. And that's one layer uh, of a neural network. So this input is a vector, that's a matrix, and then the output here can be a vector as well. Now we can then stack some of these layers, potentially multiple times, until we get to some output layer. And then we have some loss function L, which basically tells us how far is this output layer from what we would like it to be. So this is typically a single number, basically indicating how bad the performance is. And you want to make this number as small as possible. Now, when you stack it up like this, the loss is basically just some big function, let's say L of theta comma X. So theta is a vector of all of the learnable parameters. So that's all of the weights of these weight matrices and any other property if we want. And x is the input vector. So if you tried to write that down, obviously that function would be gigantic and horrible looking for many of these, uh, especially for the sort of deeper networks. But ultimately it's composed of lots of simple functions. So it's composed of matrix multiplies and sums and things like that. And a matrix multiply is just multiplications it adds. So when it comes down to it, this is basically just a lot of very simple algebraic uh, functions being composed together, but it's a lot. But that's okay because computers are good at keeping track of lots of complicated, lots of little things. So the way we optimize these things is we compute the gradient of this loss function with respect to all of the parameters. So that's each element of the, all of these weight matrices, for example. And that gives us a gradient. This gradient vector uh, is the gradient of the loss, and the ith component of that is the partial differential of the loss with respect to the ith parameter. Okay. All right, let's come back in a minute to how we actually compute that gradient. Let's suppose you've got that gradient. We can now uh, improve by uh, the, the performance, i.e. reduce the loss, by following the gradient. So that is, we take our parameters theta and we moved in the direction of some multiple alpha of this gradient vector. And if we do that, our gradient, uh, our loss should slightly decrease. And this alpha is the learning rate. So if this is small, you move a small amount each time. If it's big, you jump faster. And that's uh, one of those parameters you need to, to tune to get it just right. All right, so I'm talking very glibly about computing a gradient of this uh, vastly complicated function here. So why is this not as bad as it might seem? 
Well, first of all, you can just apply a few basic mathematical principles to compute it. So you've got the chain rule. If you've got some function f taking x to y and then g taking y to z, so that z is g of f of x, then you can compute dz by dx. It's just dz by dy times dy by dx. Or to put it another way, that z prime is the differential of g of f of x times the differential of f of x. So that's the chain rule. Uh, I imagine that most of you have known that for a long time. And you can chain that together very easily. So if you've got now n stages here, so you're going from x1 all the way up to xn, it doesn't really get much more complicated. dxn by dx1 is just uh, dxn by dxn minus 1, dxn minus 1, dxn minus 2, and, and so on. OK, so again, if you were actually doing this by hand, computing all these gradients could be quite complicated, but computer can easily keep track of those. Now, so far, that's just talking about um, real valued variables. Uh, you can do all of this with vectors. So now if your functions x, y, and z are uh, n, m, and p-dimensional uh, vectors, basically, this chain rule just changes to this. So you compute for each of these functions the Jacobian matrix, which is a matrix of partial differentials. And then the chain rule, uh, which is the, the differential of z with respect to x, it's just multiplying their Jacobian matrices. So again, it just comes back down to simple operations, matrix multiplications. Okay, so all right, it's good to know that that, but actually forget all of that. It doesn't actually matter. With the magic of modern programming, you have this thing called autograd, autogradient. Um, you just write the forward pass. So you write this bit up here which is much simpler, relatively speaking, and your library, like PyTorch or any of the others, is just going to calculate all these gradients for you. We'll see that in a minute. Um, but it really is as simple as that. You write the forward pass. As long as that forward pass is differentiable, it will be able to compute the gradients for you. Not only that, uh, but uh, the, the, the simple gradient descent rule that I mentioned uh, is can be improved, and these libraries have better algorithms than, than just doing this. OK, now what happens if we try doing this for SNNs? Well, very quickly, we run up against a problem. And that problem is the threshold function. So the threshold function is a key part of the, uh, the leaky integrate and fire model that we saw. It says that when the, thresh, when, when the membrane potential v crosses some value, something different happens. Uh, another way of putting that is that if you have uh, that something happens based on the output of the heaviside function, which is uh, one if its input is larger than zero or zero otherwise. So that's the heavy side function. Below zero is zero, and then it jumps. Uh, the problem with this is that the gradient of this function is zero almost everywhere, except at v equals zero where it's not defined. And that means that all of the gradients where this heavy side function comes in will be zero. And so if you try and use gradient descent or anything like it, uh, on a spiking neural network written with one of these, uh, nothing's going to happen. All your gradients are going to be zero. OK, so how do we solve this? Well, one of the uh, first attempts um, from, uh, from the Terry Sanofsky's group was the idea of smoothing the threshold. So we say, instead of uh, using this heavy side function in our spiking neural network, we use a sigmoid instead. So it's a smoothed version of this heavy side function. It also goes from zero to one. It also switches at around uh, the value zero. Uh, and, and that's one way of writing it here. Um, and this works. Uh, but it's slow. And it's also not a spiking neural network. Um, you can't quite interpret everything as spikes because they are no longer spikes. It's just an artificial neural network with a very particular activation function. Another approach uh, from MONFC, Friedman Zenker, and all is uh, the surrogate gradient descent. And this also starts with uh, using this smoothed version of the heavy side function. But in this case, you don't smooth it when you're calculating forward, i.e., when you're calculating the, the output of the network given its inputs. You only smooth when you're computing the gradients. So you pretend when you're computing the gradients that you're using this function. But when you're going and actually calculating the value of the spiking neural network, you use this function. 
And that's crazy. It shouldn't work. Um, you're basically optimizing a different function from the one that you're actually evaluating. Um, but it does work. Um, and it lets us train these networks, as you'll see, on, on quite interesting, complicated tasks. Uh, it's still quite slow for now. Um, there are various reasons for that that perhaps I can chat about in, in, uh, in questions afterwards if people are interested. Uh, but there's, I think that there's lots of reasons to think that we can improve on the performance of this thing. And already people have made uh, substantial improvements. Okay, so I'm going to show you some code for surrogate gradient descent in a little while. But um, also before I get to that, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the prospects for the, for the, for the future of this field. There's so much work still to be done. Um, I think I said it earlier, but there's lots of like low hanging fruit and, and possible questions projects. And, and I just wanted to get a feel for some of these to get a feel of, first of all, what's exciting about what's going on that you could have a go at doing yourself. Uh, and just give you some ideas for for for, for early projects to, to get stuck into. I think an important one, as I was just mentioning, is can we make it more efficient? It needs to run faster. Uh, that might involve a, a local learning version. That's also important for uh, biological realism. We need to make it scale better. It's hard to scale these things um, beyond a few thousand neurons at the moment. We need to better handle sparse connectivity. You'll see that the examples that I show you are going to be based on dense connectivity. Um, I think if we can, and, and, uh, and we've already started looking at, at all of these questions, um, I think that would be really interesting to look into the question of what are the computational advantages of spiking neural networks. So I mentioned this in the sort of intro to uh, the previous part. Um, I said that I was excited about the idea that spiking neural networks could be involved in fast decision making and we could use these networks to train for that. That's a project, an ongoing project that we're looking at at the moment. They may be more robust to noise. Uh, it's been suggested that they might also be more robust to adversarial attacks. They might be more generalizable. Um, could they be used as part of neuromorphic computing for low power solutions to, to various problems? Can we also use them to answer biological questions? What is the role of spikes? Um, are they just energy efficient way uh, of transmitting information or do they actually have some computational role? Um, again, the local learning rules. Can we see local learning rules as an implementation of, um, of some of these sort of gradient based approaches? Can we, and this is something that would be a bit different from like machine learning literature, can we see if there is an interaction um, with uh, synapse and neuron dynamics? Um, so, um, yeah, basically, can we show that the array of different uh, dynamical behaviors that I mentioned in the previous part, you know, like you had bursting and things like that, uh, can we show that those can also improve the computational power? of spiking neurons and, and relate that potentially to, to, to biology. All right, so I think that there's all sorts of cool stuff going on there. Um, let's at this point go and have a look at some code. So here we are back in our Jupyter notebook. Um, and this time we're going to be doing surrogate gradient descent. So the approach that I've uh, taken here is, um, is quite inspired by, certainly not stolen, Bridgman Zenka Spy Torch tutorial. So definitely recommend taking a look at that. Uh, as ever, it starts with doing a bunch of imports. Um, you can use PyTorch with a GPU. If you're using the environment that I provided, uh, it's CPU only. So this uh, could do it won't be available and it will use the CPU only version. For the small examples that I provided in this notebook, uh, using a GPU won't actually even speed anything up. It might even slow it down. So. Uh, that's fine. <clears throat> I've also got uh, a flag here, my computer is slow, which is set to true. Uh, basically, this just uses a very, very small amount of training data so that for the purposes of this tutorial, uh, you can run these training runs in, in a couple of minutes rather than having to wait 10, 20 minutes for them to run. But you can set that to false to get slightly better performance, slightly cleaner plots. And things like that. Okay. So let's start with uh, the stimulus. So we, we looked at the sound localization problem before, right? We have, um, we have a sound coming in. So here the sound is a sine wave. 
uh, and it comes to the left and the right ears. Uh, and it comes to the left ear with no delay, and it comes to the right ear with some interaural phase difference, IPD delay. Right, so here you can see that in this case it's uh, it's about 90 degrees or, or so. Um, okay, so the what we now do in this case previously, we set up um, some delays by hand. Um, in this case, we're going to try and learn which neurons to use. Um, but it's hard to get surrogate gradient descent to work with delays. So what we're going to do is we're going to seed it with a bunch of delays from a zero delay up to a maximum delay. So from each ear, there's going to be, um, I think I've set it to 100 neurons with a zero up to a maximum delay. Um, and you get that for both ears. Now that means that you can compute um, any uh, phase difference you want between the ears. So you can take the max delay here and the zero delay here, uh, and that would give you one time difference. Or you could take the max delay here compared to the zero delay here, and that will give you the negative value of that. So this gives you the full range of possible uh, delays that you might want to cover. So now at this point, each of these uh, neurons is receiving an analog signal. It's receiving a time uh, varying um, firing rate. So we put that through a Poisson process to get the output of all of these neurons. So the stimulus that we're going to basically be using is uh, 200 neurons, 100 for the left ear and 100 for the right ear. And we can take a look at uh, what that looks like. Um, so you can see that within, so on the y-axis is the neuron index and on the x-axis is time. You can see that there is within a given ear, there's a range of delays from zero to the max. And that's true for both ears. Uh, and there's also a phase difference between these. So in this case, the phase difference is minus 74 degrees, a bit smaller here. Here, the phase difference is almost the same. So the two ears are getting more or less the same input and so on. So basically the idea is you want to learn this label, minus 40 degrees, from this pattern of spikes. That's what we're trying to do. Okay, so let's have a quick look at the code here. We won't go into it too much. Um, so what we're going to do essentially is um, create a three-dimensional array, um, which we can see easiest on this line here, um, where each point... So we're going to create num samples um, different uh, so num each of num samples is one of these plots right it's a it's a sample uh, activity that we want to sort of classify uh, we're going to run the stimulus for duration steps um, in this case as you can see that's 100 steps 100 time steps and we're going to have this many so a and f per ear is the number 100 in this case it's the number of uh, of these cells per ear that there are. So the, the total number of cells in the input stimulus is going to be twice that ANF per ear. Okay, so that means that the output of this, the spikes, is going to be an array of zeros and ones, where zero indicates no spike and one indicates a spike uh, with, with this array shape. Okay, so that's what this generates. Uh, and, and you can go into this. This is all just uh, a bit of... Um, numpy logic to basically uh, compute that in a fairly efficient way generating this data by the way is, is not an inconsiderable amount of time because you're generating some fairly big arrays here okay so now we've got that the idea is that we should, as i say go from this pattern of spikes to estimating this and there's various approaches that you can take for this <clears throat> so one option is uh, by discretizing the input space so you say okay like 0 to 15 degrees is one class 15 to 30 degrees is another class and then you try and use a classifier so you try and classify which class it's in or you could use a regression approach where you try and actually get a real number as output and you can do both of these uh, what we're going to do in this one it's slightly simpler is to use the classification approach okay so we're going to divide the ipd range which goes from minus pi over 2 to plus pi over 2 into uh, num classes equal width segments uh, and then we just have a function that converts the angle into a corresponding integer class number uh, and these functions do that for you 
I've set it up so that the classes are at 50 degree increments, and so there's 12 classes in the 180 degrees range that we're looking at. So the first version of the model we're going to do is uh, just a warm up. It's non-spiking network, but that has some features of spiking. Uh, and this is kind of just to show you how PyTorch works uh, and also show you the sort of the first steps towards building a spiking neural network. OK, so our architecture is going to be this. We'll take what we've done before, which is this bit here, and we're going to feed that into a layer of 12. Um, I call them leaky integrate and fire, but with no spiking. What that means is that they have the differential equation of a leaky integrate fire, but they will never hit threshold and fire a spike and reset afterwards. So they're basically just accumulating their inputs with some decay, some leak. We take the outputs of those, we sum them, and then we take the argmax of that to estimate which class the input was in. Okay, so that's our function. Uh, essentially broken down um, and here's how we implement that in uh, PyTorch. So the first thing we need to do is we need to initialize a weight matrix. So the weight matrix is the matrix that goes from these 200 neurons to these 12 neurons. So it's a 200 by 12 um, uh, matrix. Um, so there you go, you can see that. Input size is 200, num classes is 12. So we create that as a, a PyTorch parameter. That means it can be learned. And we have this requires grad equals true. That means it's something where you, it should compute the gradient of that. And then, well, this you can, you can look up. It's basically just a standard way to initialize those to give a vaguely sensible starting point for the calculation. Now we run the simulation. So we take this input spikes um, and um, the matrix W we also give it a time constant, which I'm setting to 20 milliseconds uh, for the purposes of, uh, of the simulation. Uh, I didn't optimize that or anything. That was just a first go. Um, and now, basically, what it's going to do is it's going to compute the output of all of this uh, based on those input spikes. So to do that, we're going to have a vector of uh, membrane uh, potentials. That's going to be V. And you can see here, it's going to have batch size and num classes as its size. What's that about? So in machine learning, you often uh, do this thing of operating in batches. So rather than just running a single example through it, you might run 128 examples or 256 examples all at the same time in parallel. One of the reasons for doing that is because it's efficient way of using the GPU. Uh, and typically, you need to use the GPU to make these things run fast. Uh, but another reason for doing it um, is it actually seems to uh, improve the computation of the gradients. So it's a good thing to do, even if you weren't worried about performance um, in terms of GPU. So that means that the input spikes are going to have a uh, shape batch size. That's the number of samples we'll look at. Duration in steps, that will be the 100 time steps. And input size, that will be the 200 input neurons. And the output, output membrane potential will have uh, batch size uh, times num classes. So batch size, might we might be running it. I think I, I think I said it to 64, we'll see in a second. Uh, and num classes will be about 12. We're going to record those membrane potentials in this array VREC, which is initialized just with the first value. So this is going to store all of the membrane, stored all of the membrane potentials across all of the time steps. Uh, but we're first of all going to do it just for the single first time step, the initialization, where everything is zero. We're going to pre-calculate the effect of summing all of the spikes, which is a matrix multiplication of the input spikes vector with the, um, with the weight matrix W. And basically what we're going to do, so we do that across all time steps and across all batches. But at any given time step in the simulation, we're only going to use the values for one particular time step. So what this means is use all values where there's a colon and just use a single time step t there. So this three-dimensional array uh, that you get here will only be using it as a two-dimensional array here. And so this will be batch size, uh, and, and then that will be the number of classes output. OK, so when we run the simulation, we take uh, our, our membrane potential V, 
and we multiply it by our pre-computed constant alpha. This is exactly as we did uh, in the previous leaky integrate and fire in the first part of the tutorial. And we add in the weighted sum of the spikes. That's what you get from this h. Uh, and then we store that and continue. And we don't have to do any thresholding and resetting, remember, because we're just doing this integration step in this case. And that's it. We stack all of those together into a single vector and we return that vector. So basically that does up to here, not including this max part at the end. <clears throat> now we do the training. So we divide the input data into batches and we compute those gradients across the batches. Um, since the my computer is slow, we're going to just have a batch size of 64 and have 64 training batches. Probably using 128 and 128 would make more sense. Later, we're going to test it, so we don't need as much data to test it as to train it. So I've made that a little bit smaller. The number of samples we need to generate is the product of the batch size and the number of training batches. Now we use this generator function, it's called in Python, which basically gives us something that we can iterate over. And it's a function of the input IPDs and the spikes. And it returns the this data in a randomly permuted order, which helps to improve learning, uh, in batches. So basically it will it'll return chunks instead of the entire uh, num samples, it will return it in batches of batch batch size. And that's what this does here. You can see we we take the samples from i times batch size up to i plus one times batch size for both the spikes and the uh, IPDs, which is the labels we're trying to learn. And then it returns those. Okay, so that's the training data. Now we run the now we run the training <clears throat> to do that. We, um, we have some parameters. We're going to run it for 10 epochs of training. That's just for speed. Uh, it won't have converged by the end of those 10 epochs, so you can run it for longer to see uh, what happens if you want. We have a learning rate of 0 0.01. Just uh, by trial and error, found that's a reasonably good uh, value to use. Um, we generate the training data. We initialize our weight matrix, and then we set up our optimizer and loss function. So for the optimizer, we're using the Adam optimizer. It's, it's a bit like a stochastic gradient descent, but with some extra bells and whistles to, to make it work better. Uh, that's going to try and uh, optimize the parameters in the weight matrix W, and it will have this learning weight. We're going to use log softmax on the output. So you see here we have a, a, a vector of values here. We're going to compute log, so log softmax of those output values. Um, and that's basically a differentiable version of max. Um, so it doesn't take the input vectors and change it to 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, depending whether there's only a 1 for the maximum value, but it takes it into a, a sort of smoothed version of that. So the, the maximum one should still be the maximum, but uh, instead of being very sharp, it'll be slightly smoothed out. And that makes it differentiable. Um, and the loss function we're going to use is the negative log likelihood loss. Um, and this is the standard one you would use um, for doing these sort of classification type problems. All right, now we iterate through the number of epochs. And what we do is we say that the output is the function that we computed of x local, that's spikes, um, with the weight matrix w. We sum that output over time, uh, multiplied just by constant, just to bring things into a more reasonable uh, uh, range. We compute log softmax uh, of that output, and then compute the loss function of that compared to y local, which will be the, 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 the true labels. And then we append that uh, loss uh, to, to an array of losses so that we can uh, so that we can uh, sort of print that. All right, and now here's where the magic happens. So we're going to do the compute the gradients. We zero the gradients to start with, and then this magical line here will compute all of the gradients that I talked about before, all of that uh, vector calculus and everything, uh, chain rule. This will just magically do all of that based on this function we've written here. So we only write the forward pass, and this will magically compute the gradients of all of that, because all of the functions we used were differentiable. Now, this optimizer.step will then pass that gradient into the optimizer, which will then update the parameters. 
and then we repeat that 10 times and we print the loss functions as we go um, and, uh, and and plot them so here we go here's one i ran earlier you can see that the loss is starting at around 5.5 and falls down to about two over time so it looks like indeed it's learning although this is training data um, so it uh, it uh, it may not be learning a general solution all right so we're getting some training here now we analyze these results uh, we're going to compute the training and test accuracy so test accuracy is when you take that train network and try it out on data it's never seen before to see if it's actually uh, learning a true solution or if it's just overfitting to the training data and we're also going to some plot some histograms and confusion matrices to understand the errors it's making uh, i don't propose to go through this code in detail um, it's fairly straightforward um, application of, of what we've seen already okay so what we get is that the chance accuracy level for 12 classes should be about eight percent uh, and on the training data set, the classifier is getting around 33% accuracy. Um, and uh, that corresponds to uh, an absolute error of about 18 degrees. And on the test data set, its accuracy is a little bit lower. In this case, 20%. Um, it's still able to do the task. Uh, and its absolute error is about 26.3 degrees. So a bit worse. But you can kind of see from looking at these matrices, and let's look at the test error, that this is the distribution of IPDs it was presented with in blue. So it's about evenly distributed. And this is the distribution of its estimates. You can see that there are certain values it prefers to return. Uh, and you can see that also in the confusion matrix. So in the confusion matrix, you, uh, you basically, for each um, column here, each column gives you um, the distribution of results it gives uh, for its estimates given the true IPD. So you can see that it does, there are certain values it prefers to return and some that it basically never returns. So this sort of 20 degree class here it never returns really. Uh, and th so that's kind of weird. It doesn't look like the pictures we saw for the network that we, we built by hand. So that's not surprising. Um, this network can't do any coincidence detection um it's uh it's just uh, a weighted sum of its input spikes it's kind of surprising that it didn't even do as well as it does in fact all right so now next we're going to add spiking to that and uh, basically what we're going to do is we're going to take the input stimuli that we had before and we're going to take the output layer that we had before but we're going to insert a hidden layer of 30 leaky integrated fire neurons and these ones really are going to spike and then we're going to do uh, we're going to need to use surrogate gradient descent in this case because the discontinuity introduced by spiking is going to matter. Okay, so now now we get to see a little bit of the magic. So what we're going to do is we're going to essentially re replace the heavy side function, um, and, and instead of using that directly, we're going to subclass the the torch autograd function class with our own class that overrides the default behavior for computing the gradients. So in the forward pass, it does compute the heavy side function. And there's a bit of bluff that you don't need to understand, but basically what you need to understand is that it creates an output array, which is one if its input is greater than zero and otherwise is zero, right? So that's the heavy side function. The clever thing is that you can override separately the backward pass uh, with an entirely different um, gradient and not the gradient of this function. So in this case, we return the gradient of the sigmoid function. And now as long as we use this instead of the heavy side function, that's, that's surrogate gradient descent. So now all we need to do is we need to rewrite our spiking neural network simulator using the spike function instead of um, an explicit um, heavy side function. Okay, so let's have a look at the code for that then. Um, it's basically going to be the same for the uh, membrane only layer. Um, so what we need to do is, first of all, we're going to run through the first layer, the, the hidden neurons, and then we'll take the output of that and then feed that into the membrane layer. Uh, and we need to make a few modifications. So what we're going to do is we're going to compute the spikes with this function, right? So S is spike function of V minus one. So that means that 
this will be one if phi is greater than one and zero otherwise. So that's our threshold function. And this will be a vector on the forward pass of ones and zeros. On the backwards pass, it's going to compute the gradient of the smooth version of this heavy side function. And the other line that we need to change to keep everything differentiable is the membrane potential update line. Update line. So after we have done the exponential decay over one time step, we multiply by one minus s. So remember, s is one if there was a spike in the previous time step. So in that case, one minus s will be zero. So multiplying by one minus s will set the membrane potential to zero after there has been a spike. If there wasn't a spike, s is zero, so we're just multiplying by one, which is doing nothing. So this is neat. It's a way of resetting the membrane potential to zero after a spike, but doing it in a differentiable way so that the entire, uh, so that the entire uh, simulation is differentiable from end to end. All right, so let's look at the code. Uh, the weight matrices, we now have two of them. We have a W1 and a W2. They're computed in exactly the same way, but their sizes are a little different. Uh, now we run our simulation. We've got input spikes and two weight matrices that we pass in. Uh, we need to keep track of the membrane potential and the spikes in this case. Um, and here's the changes that I mentioned. So we multiply alpha uh, V uh, by this uh, pre-computed constant as ever. We add the weighted sum of the spikes, and then we take all of that and multiply by one minus S, as I said. And then we compute the S for the next time step, which is gonna be, as I said, the spike function at V minus one. Otherwise, entirely the same. And then the second layer is entirely the same as before, except now it's taking the output from the first layer as its input spikes, rather than uh, the input spikes passed to the function. And that's it. Uh, that's the surrogate gradient descent uh, implementation of a spiking neural network. And we train exactly as we did before, but the only difference being that we now have two weight matrices to take care of and to keep track of. Otherwise, everything entirely the same. And we can see that uh, it's, it trains quite uh, quite well as before. You see these loss functions going down. Uh, here we go. In fact, the loss functions, the numbers seem to be getting quite a lot smaller. So perhaps it's already uh, performing a little better than our previous network. Let's run our analysis and see. Yes, indeed it is. The training and the training uh, uh, data, it's getting an accuracy of 81%, uh, corresponding to a five degree absolute error in the angle. And on the test data set, it's doing almost as well as 70%, uh, corresponding to about a six degree absolute error. And you can also see that the distribution of estimates it's making are a bit more reasonable. There are still some that it seems to prefer for whatever reason that might disappear with more training. Uh, we only ran it with 10 epochs. And you can also see that the confusion matrices are more or less as you'd expect, that the majority of the guesses are along the diagonal with a few just off the diagonal. So it sort of makes sense what it's doing. Great, uh, and now, all right, that's pretty much it. Um, now, the next thing that you might want to ask is, what has it learned? Um, and that gets us kind of into the level of, uh, of open research questions. Like, how do you understand what this network has learned to do? Um, one thing you could do is uh, look at the weight matrices. So here they are. This is the matrix from the input neurons to the hidden layer. And this is the weight matrix from the hidden layer to the output neurons. And you can kind of look at that and think, yeah, it looks like there's some structure there. Maybe I could understand it, but uh, it's kind of an open question as to how exactly to do that, whether or not it's implementing anything like the, the Jeffress model we did earlier or some other model. Um, and so that uh, if you manage to finish the exercise, you could start trying to think about this. Um, I've, I've got uh, a first start on that, which is since you see that there is some structure here, certain lines seem to be, certain columns seem to have a different sort of similarities between them, more structure than others. So I sorted them uh, based on uh, their weighted mean position. Um, and then you get something that looks a bit like this in this case. So it looks a little bit more structured. You can see that there's about, in this case, about 15 or 16 neurons that have some structure and then a whole bunch of neurons that basically look more or less random. And it's probably not really using those very much. 
Uh, and then with that, you can also see that there's some sort of shapes here. If you sort of blow your eyes, you can sort of see that something is going on here. But again, it's, it's still kind of hard to interpret. I computed the product of those matrices because that's somehow an approximation of what the output neurons would be getting based on the input neurons. And again, you can see that there's some, some clear structure here. But again, it's kind of hard to say exactly what's going on. It looks kind of like it's dividing the neurons into left and right halves, something like that. That is one of the models of sound localization. It's called the, the, the hemispheric model. So maybe it's something like that. A bit difficult to tell, really. Um, I was interested to look at whether or not these column structure had something interesting. You can see that for a given column here, the first hundred neurons some are the weights from the left ear and the second hundred are the weights from the right ear. So I thought it might be interesting to, to plot some of those curves. Um, and you can see that there's somehow some different classes going on here. You see shapes like this X pattern quite often pop up. This pattern quite often pops up. This, this pattern again quite often pops up, but I don't yet know uh, what that's doing. Okay. Um, all right, so that's that's uh, that's it for the code for the moment. Let's go. Uh, let's go back to the slides briefly before we start the exercise. Okay, so I said at the beginning that there was going to be a surprise, uh, and the surprise is that I had a crazy idea while preparing this, which is uh, a, a sort of massive collaborative project with all of you. So. When preparing the surrogate gradient descent tutorial, I realized that it's actually something that hasn't even ever been done before, uh, at least to my knowledge. What I mean is sound localization with surrogate gradient descent. So surrogate gradient descent has been done, sound localization has been much studied, but combining those two is, is as far as I know, entirely new. Um, there's a long history of handcrafted models of sound localization going back 70 years, uh, but the basic questions are still, I would say, not resolved. So Perhaps there's some new insight that we could get from the surrogate gradient descent here. Maybe this could be a paper. Um, there's quite a lot of work that we would need to do to turn this tutorial into a paper. And that work is kind of lots of like somewhat separate, somewhat independent things that we'd need to check. Um, and so that leads on to the crazy idea, which is let's try and write a 250 author paper on this with all of you as, as authors on it. Um, everyone's going to be welcome to contribute. Uh, anyone who contributes a part of a figure or some text will get to be an author. And that's true even if this eventually gets removed from the paper. I think we'll probably need some sort of coordinators and the first last authors will be whoever takes charge of, uh, of that coordination. Uh, and all of the other orders, I all of the other authors I propose to put in, in random order. I think we can have ongoing discussions about this on uh, on Discord. Uh, I'm going to announce that in a second. Um, and perhaps we could try and aim to submit something in about six months time. Um, I'll email uh, all of the participants of this tutorial with uh, with a link to to sign up in case you're interested in doing that. Um, my feeling is it's a, it's a slightly crazy idea, but it has some precedent. Um, in maths, there is this uh, organization called the Polymath Project um, that was started by uh, Tim Gower some, hmm, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago now, maybe, uh, to collaboratively solve uh, math problems. Uh, and they just initially just ran that on his blog and, uh, and they managed to do it. They managed to solve, I think they've written five or six papers at this point uh, and, and solved some outstanding mathematics problems. So it does exist as something that has been successfully done before. Whether or not it can work for computational neuroscience, I have no idea. Um, I think it would be kind of cool and amazing if it does work. Uh, there's probably a fairly high chance that it won't work out, but I think it's sort of interesting enough um, that uh, that it's worth giving it a go. Uh, and uh, yes, I would love you to, to join me on doing that if you would like to do so. Cool, okay, so I said that we were gonna uh, coordinate that on Discord. Um, I will send this link around, but uh, this is a link to the Snoofer Community Discord, which uh, I'm also announcing uh, right here, right now. So uh, Snoofer was a workshop, uh, is a, well, it's a, an annual workshop that's run for two years now, 
uh, organized by Freedom and Zenka and myself uh, and, and a few other people um, with talks about this new approach to uh, training and studying spiking neural networks. Um, you can go and have a look at my uh, YouTube channel and check out some of the previous talks from uh, from those workshops. Um, it's very much the sort of thing that I've been talking about in the second half of this tutorial. So we've created uh, a Discord um, for this uh, for this community, um, and uh, yes, we would love for people to come and join that and generally just talk about anything to do with this new approach. So announcement of papers, discussion, uh, that sort of thing. Basically, anything that is uh, that will bring people from this community together. So please do join that. One of the things that we're going to organise is a probably monthly uh, seminar series. Um, and it's going to start uh, with this talk from, uh, I hope I pronounced the name correct, uh, Reza Shadmer on uh, population coding in the cerebellum, a machine learning perspective. And so that's on uh, April 6th. So please do come along to that. There will be links and stuff posted in that Discord and on Twitter and everything uh, when the time comes. All right, uh, so let's get to the exercise now. Um, what I've done is I've got a version of the notebook with some of the code missing. Uh, and the first thing to do is to fill in the missing parts of the code. I think that's a good way to understand the code a little bit better. Uh, and make sure you, you, know, you properly understand it so that you can uh, get something equivalent to what I just showed. If you manage to get that done, you could try improving the model as, as we did in the first part. Um, you could alternatively try building a version of the model that uses uh, regression rather than classification. Uh, or you could put in some effort trying to understand those uh, solutions that I was talking about at the end. Like, how is it, how is it doing what it's doing? Uh, cool. Okay. All right. Well, um, time to get to it. Thank you very much.